He is risen. Indeed. Listen, it's celebration day for believers. The central theme of everything that Christianity is revolves and evolves around the fact that Jesus, the innocent Lamb of God who knew no sin, went to the cross, became sin on the cross for us, paid the price for our sin, was buried, and three days later rose from the grave. That is cause for celebration. Amen. I think some place somewhere down the road, you know, the church has forgotten how to party. <laughs> the world's trying it, but they don't get it. You know, after their parties, you end up in car wrecks and, you know, headaches and divorce and everything else that goes on with those kind of parties. But listen, we have something to celebrate. We have something to party about. I remember reading a story of, uh, by a guy named Ben Patterson who was relating a story from a friend of his who visiting a village in Southeast Asia. Uh, one thing these missionaries were doing as they traveled in Southeast Asia was to take the Jesus film and put it in a native language. They were seeking to go to villages that hadn't heard the gospel. So uh, they went to this one village, this missionary group did, and they set up the projectors and the screen. And in fact, in this village, uh, most people had never seen a movie or TV or anything. It was, uh, the real excitement was generated. Everybody from the village is showing up and finding a place to sit in the lawn. And they start the film, the Jesus film, and as it goes along, people are just happy. I mean, they've never seen a movie before. It's just lifelike. It's real. Uh, it's in their language. As the film progresses, they get to the part where Jesus is being rejected, then through the false trials, then into the beating. At this point, they start getting upset, the villagers do. In fact, you know, they're, they're, they're really upset. They're standing up in their seats. They're, they're you're yelling at the projector guy, you know. He said, I felt like they were getting ready to attack me. He said, uh, they, they couldn't believe, here's this Jesus, this humble Jesus who has healed the sick, you know, and the lame and opened blind eyes and raised the dead and children love him. Uh, they couldn't believe that he was being beaten like this. In fact, the guy said, I felt like they were going to, you know, beat me. He said, I, stopped, I had to stop the projector. He's getting so out of hand. And calm the crowd and say, listen, it's not over yet. All right, just be patient with me. It's, it, it gets better. So then he clicks it back on, and they hadn't got to the crucifixion yet. When they get to the crucifixion scene, Jesus being beaten, the nails, I mean, they are outraged now. They're screaming. They're mad. They're upset. You know, they just, he literally has to stop the film again and, and say, folks, now settle down. We hadn't got to the end yet. So he clicks it back on, and then comes the three days and the resurrection of Jesus, and then they just break out, and, I mean, a party breaks out. They're celebrating, they're dancing, they're jumping up and down, they're jubilant, they're overwhelmed with joy, you know, at the celebration of a risen Lord and a risen Savior. I think somewhere we've forgotten how to do that. We should be excited. We should be overjoyed. Easter ought to mean something to, to the child of God, to the believer. And I believe for most of us this morning, it really does. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is at the very heart of everything we believe. It, everything stands and falls in our belief system at the, at the resurrection of Jesus. You know, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead, then, you know, there is no real hope for us. In fact, I want to read Pastor Tim read a while ago from 1 Corinthians 15 down to verse 11. We're going to start with chapter 15, verse 12, as we look at this resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The theme, obviously, is the resurrection and that the resurrection of Jesus does make a difference in our lives if we truly believe the message that's given to us in the resurrection story. It'll transform a life, it'll change your heart. So let's look at this this morning in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19. Now if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is also in vain. Moreover, even we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified God that, raised, that he raised up Jesus Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact, you know, the dead are not raised. In other words, how, we, how can we preach this if it didn't happen? Verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, now catch this, follow the logic. If Jesus isn't risen from the dead, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. They also which have fallen asleep in Christ 
Those who we love and know that knew Jesus, then they're just perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men most miserable. If we're just putting our faith in a, a not resurrected Jesus, then there's no power behind the gospel. There's no authority. There is no, ultimately, no resurrection. And one thing that we discover about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is that there is a resurrection. The people whom he's speaking here in Corinth are people mixed with a lot of different cultures and a lot of different pagan belief systems. It's one of those crossroads of the, of the known world it was, like Ephesus. A lot of different cultures would come through here. Most of them did not believe in a resurrection. So Paul is seeking at this point to clear up the confusion. I know you're hearing, he's saying, there's no resurrection of the dead. Because that's where all the pagan philosophies kind of center around. You know, there, there's no uh, individuality. There's no uniqueness to, to humans in, in regard to life and death. In fact, some religions in the culture which he was addressing believed in, some, some people do still today, it's called soul sleep. That once you die, your body dies, it disintegrates, and the soul of the spirit just kind of slumbers. And that's it. It's over. Then there, on the other hand, there would be a group within that Corinth group who, what they, who had the, the concept of materialism. Materialism believes in an utter extinction, total annihilation, you know, that when you, when you die, you know, there's, there's nothing human, physical, or otherwise that survives death. It's just over, it's done. It, death ends it all. And there's familiar philosophy, which was very popular at the time, of reincarnation. We just kind of recycle, you know. When you die, depending on how you lived, you could come back as a goat or, you know, a bug. Or, and then if you kind of were a good goat or a good bug, you might come back as a human later on. Who knows how it works? I, I don't understand the system, how about the, the point system there. But nonetheless, the reincarnation. But again, there's no telling what you would come back as. Then, then there was a, a popular theory in that day called uh, ab, ab, absorption. Absorption uh, basically said that the spirit, or at least some certain part of your spirit, returns back to the source of all things, whatever that is in the concept that they're talking about here, and just, you know, gets absorbed back into the divine mind or, or the divine being. Now, that's a popular philosophy today with a lot of people, you know. We have this divine spark, which we all come out of, and when we die, we just kind of go spark back with the other sparks that fill up the big spark, and we're all just kind of sparkly. And that's, that's the idea of, you know, of just absorption, where we go back to it. And then there's the most popular philosophical idea of the day, at least among the Greeks was, and this was the major cultural influence of the day, was this, this idea of dualism. Now, dualism kind of worked with what the Gnostics of the day believed. You know, there, there's this distinction between that which is physical and that which is spiritual. And dualism approaches, if it's physical, then it's intrinsically evil. You know, and if it's spiritual, it's intrinsically good. And the idea of a resurrection to those people was, was really repulsive because they believe that, you know, once you die, you can, you vacate the, the physical. Who, who wants to carry, you know, who wants to have a, a corrupt, uh, you know, a, a physical body again? It's, it's kind of like the body's just kind of like a, a casket, a tomb that we're entombed in until we're freed one day by death. And then we just kind of, we, we're off in this little spiritual la-la land where we're just kind of spirit beings and that, that's, that's, that's the best that we can hope for in that regard. In those views, the human body or even human personhood or human individuality or your human distinctiveness or your uniqueness is, at death is forever lost. But not so with the gospel. God created you. And Jesus is, the Bible tells us, in his resurrected life, he is the first fruits of the greater resurrection that is going to follow for all those who believe. That there's no evilness to this new body which we're going to have. It's, it's a glorified physical body. Now, Jesus, remember, in that glorified physical body, after the resurrection, he ate with them. He spoke with them. He said, touch me. You can feel my, my flesh, see the scars that were in my hands. So it's a glorified, unique physical body. But it's suited not just for the physical elements in the world around you, this new glorified body is also suited for the spiritual, the afterlife, the world to come. And Jesus in his resurrecting power serves as an example as to what we will be if we choose to follow him in faith. And we too will also have that glorified body. I'll read you in a moment a little bit more from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where he talks about how the immortal puts off 
that the old shell and now we have this new immortality and we have this, what was corruptible now is now incorruptible and we're made new. It's not like Plato who preached and philosophically approached the whole idea with the idea of this absorption mindset that you just kind of go off into, into a little part of the, of the greater divine part. We are unique in this regard. So Paul is, is addressing them and he's talking about this, this issue of this resurrection because there were some again who would detest the idea. And he says to them, if Christ is not risen, in fact, I, I just kind of made a little list here. I, I knew you'd want it. If Christ is not risen, then, then, then watch up. Well, he makes several statements here. First of all, if Jesus, well, you're going to have to hit those lists for me, would you? It's not, it's not going down the list for me. So if Christ is not risen, first of all, it may not even work for you. If there's no resurrection of the dead, he says, first of all, you can go to the notes, our preaching is useless. Our preaching is useless. In other words, we're just wasting our time. If there's no resurrection of Jesus Christ, if we serve a dead Savior, then what's the use? Number two, our faith is useless. If Christ is not raised from the dead, then what you believe is not going to make any difference whatsoever. In fact, he uses the word useless. It translates pity. It translates futile, you know. In fact, it's a futility that it's just, it's, it is so futile, there's no, there's no answer for it. The third thing he says, if Christ is not risen, then we are useless and we are liars. Basically, put it down, we're useless liars. Not only you know, are we futile, we're, we're just telling us a lie. Why would we say Christ is risen when he hadn't been risen? The fourth thing, we're useless, is what he says. We're still in our sins. So not only do we don't have any, our preaching is useless, you know, our faith is useless, we're useless, we're useless liars, and we're useless and still in our sins. And then he says, if Christ is not risen, those saints who died before us, their faith, their belief was useless. We're a bunch of useless folks, aren't we? Number six, he said, and we are to be pitied because we're so useless. That's the way it all breaks out. If it's not true, then you're to be pitied for believing what you believe and you're wasting your life, wasting your time. Your life has no meaning. It has no substance whatsoever. In fact, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, and what value was there uh, in fighting the wild beasts, those men of Ephesus, if there be no resurrection for the dead? In other words, why go face the lions? Fight for your life there the lions. If there's no resurrection, he said, let's just feast and get drunk and tomorrow we die. Now that's the mentality of a lot of people, isn't it? Let's just party and die. Let's just go get drunk and let you die. Hey, I'll tell you right, honestly, folks, if it's not true, that's where I'm headed. I'm gonna go get drunk and die. Because life has no meaning. That's right. if, if there's no substance. But God made us very uniquely to live with him eternally. Created Adam and Eve for a long-term eternal re relationship. You were created for the same reason. Long-term eternal life relationship with God himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so let me just take a moment this morning and take these six things and flip them around. Because Christ is risen, by the way. <laughs> He's risen. Amen. So I know this is a, just taking, it doesn't take a great exercise of logic, but let's look at these on a different level, all right? If Christ is risen, and by the way, let me say Christ is risen without the F. So if Christ is risen, guess what? Our preaching is essential and life-changing. In fact, let me just put it this way. If Christ is risen, we have a message. I have a message. You have a message, and that's what he's saying here. He said, otherwise, our, our preaching, what we would say, what we would share, is useless. But listen to what 1 Corinthians, when Paul writes this, the first of his letters says, in chapter 1, verse 21, he says, then after the wisdom of God, the world by their wisdom did not know God. So it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God says, in other words, I'm going to tell, I'm going to make it real clear for people to be saved. I'm just going to give them a message. Now, the message is the gospel. God sent his son. God so loved the world that gave his only begotten son. That we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We're all, going, we're all under judgment of sin. But Jesus came, faced our judgment, died on the cross, rose from the dead by the power of God, and now sits at the right hand of God the Father and is coming again one day. We have a message. Let me put it this way. I've got something to say. I have a message. Try that with me. Say it. I have a message. I have a message. No, no, no. That's terrible. I have a message. Now let's say it like we mean it. I have a message. Amen. You have something to say. I tell you, when you get to work on money or there by the water cooler with other people, raise your hand and say, I have a message. 
if you're at school and it's getting quiet in the room and you just raise your hand as a teacher, I got something to say. And what are you going to say? Jesus is risen from the dead. <laughs> Life-changing message. Hey, you know, if you're sitting at the red light, roll down your window, honk at the guy next to you, say, hey, I have a message. <laughs> He's risen indeed. I've got something. And this is what he's saying. Our message is not useless. What we believe in is based on fact. I mean, the big guns of atheism and ignorance have been aimed at the resurrection of Jesus for centuries. I'm always amazed at how many books have been written by people who were agnostics at one time or atheists who set out to disprove the resurrection. I mean, you got guys like Josh McDowell. I mean, it's endless. The list goes on. In fact, the movie Ben-Hur was written by a guy who didn't believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, started studying the resurrection, got under conviction, gave his life to Christ. I mean, it's just, it's countless. I mean, through the ages, you just see historical, from lawyers to leaders to politicians, who say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove it. And they go through it and end up getting, giving their life to Christ. Because the evidence is outstanding. What did we just read? Tim read a while ago. 500 people at one time saw him. I mean, if we're standing in a court of law, and the issue is the government or whoever the state versus the resurrection of Jesus, the state loses. There's too many witnesses. There's too much fact. There's more factual evidence to prove the existence of Jesus Christ than there was Pilate or even George Washington. More historical facts and evidence. Hey, we have got, we got something to say. The second part I don't want you to miss here, if Christ is risen, then our faith changes lives. Now and forever. He said, if Christ is not risen, your faith is useless. Hey, Christ is risen, our faith is useful. Our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in this message, our faith in the gospel has created a transformation in our life that has changed just literally now and forever because not only am I saved now, I've become a new creation now, God's done an internal work. The day's coming when Christ will raise these literal physical bodies off this planet, from the grave, or in the rapture for those who are still alive. We brought up in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, your body is going to be changed like that of Jesus' body. The absolute ultimate resurrection. We say, hey, you be going to say, he's risen, he's risen. I'm gonna say, we's risen. <laughs> Amen, we've risen. We're, we're raised up in immortality. Again, Jesus is just the first fruits of that. He, he set the pattern. He shows us what is to come by his own resurrection. So our faith makes a difference. I love what Peter said in, 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 in 1 Peter 1. He says, listen, you're receiving the end of your, of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. What is the, the end of my belief? The end of my, the end of my commitment to Christ is absolute salvation. Absolute salvation. I'll be saved. I am saved. Praise the Lord. I'm going to be saved, but the day is coming. I'm going to be so saved. I, bear, I will have to be transformed and glorified to be able to bear it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to have to experience a change to be able to handle heaven. Amen. That's what God's going to do for you because you see it already evidenced in what he did for Christ in raising him from the dead. He'll raise you from the dead as well. The third point, you still with me? Yes. If Christ is risen, then we are in the truth. He said earlier, if Christ is not risen, you're just useless liars. But that's not true. We, Christ is risen, so we are in the truth. First John, G, Jesus, I mean, the, the apostle said, we're of God. If you know God, you hear us. If you don't know God, you don't hear us. But hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He says, because you have come to Christ, you're able to discern what's right and really wrong. You're able to discern what is true and what is not true. Now, he's not talking about in the context of teaching your little child, you know, this is right, this is wrong. He's talking about in the greater context of absolute discernment over knowing that you're on the right path, you're following the right way, your, your relationship to Christ is sure and true, you know where you're going. This is real, this is truth. In other words, because I have this faith in Jesus Christ, I have, I have a meaning. My life has meaning, it's true. If, if, I'm, if I'm following something that's not real or, or genuine or something I've sought to kind of make up in my own mind, and a lot of people do that, well, here's the way I feel about it. You know, you've talked to those people, here's the way I feel about it. <laughs> Listen, if the way you feel about it is <laughs> not this, you're in trouble. Yes. Because the way you feel about it is going to falter. It's going to crumble. It's not going to stand. Anything that's not true does not last. How do you define that which is eternal? Truth. Truth lasts. 
Eternity, you have a substance, you have a foundation. And because I have meaning, I have purpose. All right? I have purpose. My life means something. I'm not just sitting here on planet Earth, all right, in my little GPS location, sitting on the planet while it rotates around the sun, ever 360, whatever, you know. My life has a definition. I have clarity. One thing that when I gave my life to Jesus began to unfold is clarity. You know, I can see clearly now the clouds are gone. <laughs> because Christ has come in. He makes that kind of difference. I am in the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He went on to say in John 8, you shall know the truth. And that's going to lead to freedom. You'll be free. When you know truth, there's freedom. No longer fear. Not living in doubt. Not living in chaos. Not living in confusion. Not living, you know, with this idea, well, Brother Joe, the world's just falling apart. Hey, it's going to do that. I read the book. It said it's going to happen. But it's going to be a new heaven, new earth, new body. Going to be able to handle it all. So I'm not going to sweat the showers. The, the way of the cross is a way of clarity and substance and purpose and definition for your life that nothing else in the world can give you. You go to bed at night saying, what's it all about? Hey, it's all about the cross. If you'll come to Jesus and come to the cross, your life will be changed. We are in the truth because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But fourth, he says, if, you, if Christ is not risen, then your faith is useless and you are still in your sins. I've got some news. Christ is risen. I'm no longer a bound and a slave to my sins. Now, now catch this because some people don't understand. They, they kind of get it from the idea that I'm free from the penalty of my sin. So since I am saved, I'm not going where? I'm not going where? I'm not going to hell, all right? I am, and by that, not just going, I'm not under the judgment of God. Because the judgment of God rests against unrighteousness and, and hearts that are, that are not right with God. There's a day of wrath coming the Bible talks about. I ain't, I ain't scared. Excuse the English. <laughs> I ain't worried. Why? Because it ain't resting on me. I'm under the blood of Jesus. I'm in the resurrected life. I have a, I have a hope and a foundation in Christ Jesus. So, but not only am I, am I saved from the penalty of sin, hold on to your hats. I'm saved from the power of it. Now, this might confuse some folks, but I, I, I've had long discussions with lots of people, this Christian people over this. But the Bible does teach, if you read Romans 6, that we are free from sin. That we don't have to. Sin's no longer our master. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I don't have Now, you say, well, why do I sin? Because you like it, all right? <laughs> Let's be honest. People still sin because they choose to, because they love it. All right? We sin because we're in bondage to sin. But what Christ does, he breaks that bondage. He breaks those bars. He breaks that yoke that holds you in captivity. And now in Christ, if you choose to be free, you be free because he paid the price for your freedom. That's the power of the resurrection. It conquered death. It conquered sin. It conquered Satan. It conquered hell. It conquered the grave. It's the power of the resurrected life. I don't have to do what the devil tells me to do. I can do what God's called me to do. Now that's freedom. Some people think freedom is just doing whatever I want to do. You know, if I don't get drunk, I'm free. No, that's not freedom. In fact, if I am free and I'm going to do what I want to do, I'm going to love Jesus if I'm truly free because he put that in my heart and he put it in your life. So if Christ is risen, by the way he is, if Christ is risen, I am free. I am not in bondage to my sin any longer. John 6 says, or John 8 says that if the Son therefore makes you free, you shall be free Indeed. So he's risen indeed, therefore I'm free indeed. How about you? Now, let's not stop there. There's a couple more points he did make. Number five, he says your faith is hopeless. And those people who've died before you in Christ, the ones you care about, the ones you love, your friends, your families, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, husbands, hey, they lived a useless life. It's hopeless. But if Christ is risen from the dead, hey, the saints, those people who knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, when they stepped out into eternity, they stepped in right into the very presence of God. They stepped into the glories of heaven. To be absent from the body, the Bible says, is to be present with the Lord. End of sentence. <laughs> to be absent from this body until I get my new glorified body, I'm with Jesus. That's where, you, that's where your loved ones are. That's where the people you care about are. If they knew Christ, then they are in the very presence of God and therefore we have a sure hope. Listen again to 2 Corinthians where Paul says, we are confident. Catch that? We're not, we're not well, I hope so. That's what most people think hope is. We are confident 
And I say willing. Understanding to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. He goes on, Jesus says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself that where I am, you may be also. Next verse. If it were not true, I wouldn't say it. In other words, it's true. Now he put the stamp on that. He put the check mark on that. He settled that issue when he conquered death and came out of the grave. So I have a hope. Now it's not like Sam, where are you gonna go when you die? Oh, I hope I go to heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm channeling that guy for some reason. I'm sorry, you know, he, whoever he is. It's really me before I met Jesus, all right? <laughs> I hope so. I'd like to think so. How many, how many here today? Don't raise your hands, please. That, that's your mindset. I'd like to think so. I've been a good guy. That's, there's no hope there. That's not, that's not the hope that the Bible's talking about. It says we have a hope. The hope the Bible's talking about is the very word that he's using here. We are confident. See, our hope mindset is this. Oh, man, you know, I want to go fishing tomorrow. So I hope that the weather's good. You know? I'm thinking about marrying this guy. I hope it works out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That kind of hope. That, yeah, it, all, there's all kinds of variables involved. All right? Circumstances, weather, situations, you know, stupidity, all kinds of things can change the scenario. But when we say as Christians, I have a hope, it, it's not like that. I'm confident. If I would have dropped dead right here, right now, boom, I'm in the presence of God. I mean, doubts about it. How can you say that, Pastor? Because Jesus rose from the dead and it was his words and his promise. If we have something from this body, be present, Lord. So we have a hope. They have a hope. And number six, by the way, don't miss this because some of you are not sure about this. He said, we're useless and we're to be pitied if Christ is not risen. But if he is risen, people ought to be saying about you, I want some of that. I want some of that. I, I mean, maybe that's one of the things that led you to the Lord. But as you looked around at people's lives that you saw coming to Christ in your own family or friend circle, and you saw them coming to Jesus, how many of you could say, in looking back, in retrospect of your own testimony, you could say, you know, there was a Christian guy or a Christian girl, somebody over there whose life was so different it really made me get interested in the gospel. They, were so, they had peace, they had joy. I mean, the worst of the worst. I mean, circumstances were horrible, and they're still, we're walking in peace. And there was such a, a, a you know, a, an essence about their life of confidence and hope that even when the rest of the world's, you know, it looks like it's going to hell in a handbasket, they're holding on. I believe that's the way it's supposed to work. Paul said, you're living epistles to be read of all men. Everybody will be able to look at your life and say, I want some of that. Amen. I want some of that. I never forget one of the first times that uh, I'd just gotten saved maybe six or seven months early at this point in time, and my brother was doing a, a crusade. And I went with him to help him with the crusade situation. And it, it, one of my responsibilities was when the service and the invitation was over, lead the people out and kind of say a few words to them about counselors will meet with you, uh, people be patient, you know, and just get, get everybody assigned a counselor and have a word of prayer with them. So uh, there was a guy there that I had met also, and Franklin, Gene Cowles, and I may have referenced Gene before. Gene had been, had been saved about a year, I guess, and he'd gotten his mother to come to the crusade. And uh, she comes forward during the crusade. And she's almost 80 years old, all right? And she comes forward, and so I'm looking around the room, I see Gene, he's way back there, excited, kind of waiting out there to see what's going on with the mom. She's gotten saved, she's made a commitment to Christ, and he's just beaming out there, so I, I kind of go check on mom for him. And I, I put my arm around her, and the counselor's kind of talking to her, and I said, Mrs. Cowles? Yes, sir. I said, uh, I know Gene, yeah. I said, I said uh, what, what'd you come forward for today? Her words. Still ringing my ear. I love it. Listen, I don't know what y'all did to Gene, but I want the same thing. <laughs> I don't know what you did to him, but that's what I want. Whatever happened with him, is that what people say about you? Or do people say, if that's what Christianity is, yeah, I don't think so. Well, see, that's not genuine Christianity, is it? Our life's to be envied. The Bible says we're like salt. You know what salt does? It creates a thirst. It, it, it makes people thirsty for something. And we're like salt. We're like a city that's set on a hill. We, we can be seen. Why? I have a message. 
<laughs> I've got something to say. And I ought to be saying it with confidence and with clarity. Jesus is risen from the dead. And if you're living that life and enjoying that life and embracing Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and this day means something to you, these are the things you need to understand. That you are unique and you are different. You do have something to say. And your message is powerful and it changes lives and it's meaningful. You are in the truth. You have a certain confident hope. And people, when they look at your life, should have the same attitude. There's something about them that's different. I need that in my life. They may not even be able to define it completely. But there is that day coming. When as Christ is risen, we too shall be risen. Paul closes this letter in the same chapter. He's getting down into verse 51 through, through 57. He says, behold, I'm going to show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, we're not just going to go, you know, die. What he's talking about here. And to go to the presence of God. He's talking about our body going to sleep, not our soul and spirit, because that's what the Lord we read a while ago. But we shall all, all of us that know Christ, we will all be changed in, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, because the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that's written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? He said, listen, I'm gonna tell you something, guys. He said, just as Christ is risen, that's what this whole chapter's about, he's risen indeed, and because he's risen, you're gonna be raised just like he was raised incorruptible, immortal, eternal, fitted for heaven or for earth because there will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth. And we'll be able to exist and live and to function freely in both of those because of who we are in Christ Jesus. I believe that with all my heart. Let me close, lest I start preaching. Jesus stand at tomb him. Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, he hasn't experienced the resurrection. He knows it's coming. He knows all things. He knows where he's headed. He knows what's going to happen. He knows about the cross. He knows the suffering because he came to give himself as a sacrifice for our sins. But he also knows about the glorious resurrection. He knows that in one moment of time, the Father will turn his face upon the Son. Absolutely forsaken for your sin and for my sin. But he also knows that in that instant of time when Jesus ascends on high, upon his death... First of all, descends to the lower parts and tells the devil, you're defeated. <laughs> Takes the keys to life and death, ascends to heaven. His blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven. It's God reaches down. Can you, I can't even imagine. The glory and the power of the resurrection for God to literally reach down and that tomb roll away, touch the body of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me put it this way. People, even Jesus, if there is no resurrection, don't get resurrected. All right? They may resuscitate you after 45 minutes or something like that. We hear all these stories. But a resurrection of absolute death. Corruption is already starting in three days, folks, right? Jesus is giving us this symbolic picture of what's getting ready to happen to him at the tomb of Lazarus. Lord, he's been dead for days. If we roll away that stone, he stinks. The difference between a man and the God-man is Jesus comes out gloriously, not bound by grave clothes, nicely folded up and left beside the bed. <laughs> Walks out victorious over life and death. He's risen. He's risen indeed. And because he's risen, you and I can be risen. I can't imagine what it's going to be like. Oh, man. When we stand in heaven with the millions of people who've given their life to Christ, who've committed their hearts to him, many who literally paid the price of their lives to stand for Christ Jesus. And that moment, and the Bible talks about that great scene of the judgment seat when everybody's going to be there. Can you imagine all those people who just really came up with their own solution to the issue, who didn't even understand the issue to start with? The issue was we're separated from God by our sins. 
God clearly has given us a message that we're to preach and has chosen the method of that, preaching that message to reach people that are lost. So we have this great obligation that comes with it. But can you imagine all your life just fighting off the Christians and fighting off witnesses and fighting off preachers and fighting off your Christian relatives who try to tell you about Jesus? Ah, I know, you know, you're idiots. I know. My way, I'll be a good person. To stand there in that moment and realize all that good person stuff was a bunch of junk. All your hopes in the wrong basket, so to say. Only to hear that the defining words for your eternity in heaven or hell were this. If I knew Jesus. Because Jesus will say, he spoke it himself. He said to the crowds. Many will say unto me on that day, Lord, Lord. And he say, I'll never knew you. Do you know him? Do you follow him? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? I'm not asking if you got the facts all straightened down your head. I'm asking if there ever been a heart commitment because the belief that the Bible talks about is not just kind of a casual little mindset. It's a commitment. So I ask you today, do you have a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or what you have is merely just a, some kind of an intellectual foundation that you stand on. It's not a biblical foundation. What you need is a biblical foundation because that's where the confidence is. That's where the hope is. That's where the faith is. It's in Christ. So I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning. As we celebrate this resurrection day, what better day would there be for you to give your life to Christ if you don't have that confidence? What better time in all of eternity than right here, right now, that you would surrender your heart and your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? There's no better time, there's no better place than here and now. In fact, the Bible even says that today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. If there's never been a time in your life of giving your heart and your life to Jesus, this is the perfect moment for you. This is to really to say, this is where you were born. And God has graced you with a message that's clear and simple, that Jesus loves you, he died for you, you can have new life. Repent and believe, turn your life over to him. Quit following yourself, quit surrendering to the world, quit following your sin, follow Jesus. And life will start to mean something for you. This is, this is a day of beginnings for many people. Let it be your day of beginnings. In just a moment, we begin to worship the Lord and sing. We give at Believer's Fellowship an altar call, an invitation. It's a very simple time for us to take the time and to, to seize the moment of responding to whatever God has said to us. If God has given you a word today, if he's spoken to your heart about one, maybe just giving your life to him, what would hinder you? Jesus asked the question, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What's more important than God? What's more important than eternity? What's more important than your salvation? Answers nothing. Say, well, I don't know what to do. Well, I'm right there we are. It starts by just surrender. Lord, I surrender. I give my heart, my life to you. Acknowledgement that I'm not God and you are.